Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this organic chemistry lab video covers the hydroboration and oxidation of one octene experiment. This is part three, week two of the pre-lab lecture covering the oxidation reaction. The procedure for this experiment will involve reading the procedure in the lab manual, viewing this narrated PowerPoint presentation and watching the video on carrying out the experiment. This is the second part of a two-part experiment. The previous week's part dealt with the hydroboration part of the experiment this week's experiment deals with the oxidation portion of the reaction. Each part of the experiment has a separate quiz on saplinglearning.com. There's one notebook post-lab template file on Google Docs to complete for the entire experiment. Complete it this week and then submit it to Canvas. And then there's only one lab homework for this experiment on saplinglearning.com. Safety for this week's experiments covered on this slide. We'll be working with a three molar solution of sodium hydroxide, which is somewhat caustic and irritating to skin. So you should avoid skin contact with that reagent. Wear gloves. We'll also be working with 30% hydrogen peroxide, which is a strong oxidant and can cause skin burn. So you should definitely wear gloves when working with that material. Furthermore, hydrogen peroxide reacts with many organic compounds, including acetone to form explosive peroxide. So it's really important that all peroxide waste be handled properly and not disposed in the acetone waste jugs. There'll be special waste containers put out for the hydrogen peroxide waste that you generate today. Finally, use care when working with needles. The hydroboration oxidation reaction sequence is a two-step process to convert an alkene into an alcohol. Here's the overall process. In this reaction, we're using one octene. We had it react with boring THF in the first step, and this week in the second step, we're having it react with hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide, and the result are two alcohols. There's one octanol and two octanol, as well as a sodium tetrahydroxyborate product. Just to refresh your memory, last week we did the hydroboration experiment where we put one octene in with borine THF and that resulted in a hydroboration reaction, which was a syn addition process where the boron and one of the hydrogens added across the two carbons of the carbon-carbon double bond. That gave us two regioisomeric alkyl borane intermediates. There's the intermediate where the boron adds to the less substituted of the two carbons of the alkene, and then there's the intermediate where the boron is added to the more substituted carbon of the alkene and those are the two possible products that are in the reaction mixture. And the atoms are color coded here so you can see what reagents the different atoms came from, where the orange atoms came from the boring THF reagent. This week we're gonna be doing an oxidation step where we put these alkyl borane reagents in with hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide, and that's gonna cause an oxidation reaction where essentially the boron will get replaced by an OH group. The mechanism for that will be covered on a subsequent slide. In an overall sense, boron is getting replaced by an OH group, and it'll happen in both cases. The species with the boron on the less substituted carbon will end up giving a less substituted alcohol. The species with the boron and the more substituted carbon will give an alcohol and the more substituted carbon. And these have names. The species with the less highly substituted alcohol is referred to as an anti-Markovnikov product. That's the less substituted version. While the species that's more substituted is referred to as a Markovnikov product. And there'll be lecture videos that explain more about Markovnikov versus anti-Markovnikov selectivity. But for this experiment, it's just good to know that there are two possibilities and they have those two names. Here's how the oxidation reaction works. It starts with hydrogen peroxide, which is shown here in green, and sodium hydroxide, which is also shown in green. The first step is that sodium hydroxide deprotonates the hydrogen peroxide to give a hydroperoxide anion shown here. That species then reacts with the alkyl borane, attacking it at boron to produce this oxidized borane species where now the boron has made a new bond to the hydrogen peroxide molecule. Then in the next step, a rearrangement happens where the carbon group migrates to form a new bond with oxygen. Here, the electrons in the boron carbon bond move to make a new bond to the oxygen of the OH, of the peroxide, and at the same time, the weak oxygen-oxygen bond breaks and those electrons go to oxygen. The result is the alcohol product along with a borate molecule which can grab a proton off of water to regenerate the hydroxide and the process can continue with additional molecules of peroxide to give the final products which are two more equivalents of alcohol and the final boron species. Today we're going to be using a new technique called reflux. Here's the reflux apparatus. It consists of a hot plate which we're going to use as a heat source a water bath, which we're gonna to use to transfer heat to the reaction vessel, which is this round bottom flask. We've got a boiling chip in there to smooth out the boiling. And then we've got a condenser that's straight up and down. The point of reflux is to heat the reaction 
to increase its rate, but not remove solvent. That's different than distillation. So you want to keep the solvent in the vessel, and the purpose of the condenser is to keep the solvent from escaping. So the solvent will boil, it will vaporize, it will climb up into the apparatus, hit the cold condenser, and then roll back down. The up and down travel of the solvent, vaporizing, condensing, and then going back down, is where the reflux term comes from. You should have your condenser water going in through the bottom port and coming out through the top port. That allows air bubbles to escape and the condenser will stay full of water then. And it's important to leave the top uncapped. That's because we don't want pressure to build up in the apparatus. In the last step of the experiment, we'll be doing GC analysis, gas chromatography. After you've isolated your product, get its mass on the analytical balance. That's the balance that can read out to four decimal places. Then we'll need to dilute the product mixture for GC analysis by dissolving one drop of it in one milliliter of acetone. And GC standards of tetrahydrofuran, THF, the starting material, one octene, one of the products, two octanol, and the other product, one octanol, have been run for you and they're going to be posted above each GC instrument. You should record those standard retention times in your electronic lab notebook. You can use those then when you look at the peaks in your experimental chromatogram to identify the peaks. You'll also want to get statistics information and integration information for each peak in your chromatogram except acetone. Also, label each peak to identify it. We're specifically going to be looking for tetrahydrofuran, 1 octene, 2 octanol, and 1 octanol, and we'll know those peaks by the retention time when we see them. However, if there are other peaks in your chromatogram that you can't identify, you should label those as unknowns. The next slide here talks about calculating actual yields of 1 octanol and 2 octanol. Your reaction mixture contains multiple different compounds. You're going to need to use your GC chromatogram to calculate the mass of 1 octanol and 2 octanol that you actually produced in the experiment and then use those numbers in the percent yield calculation. Here's how you do that. To determine the mass of 2 octanol that was produced in the reaction, you'll need to refer to your chromatogram and look for the area of the 2 octanol peak and then divide that by the sum of the areas of all the peaks except acetone, and then multiply that by the mass of your crude product mixture. That'll give you the mass of 2 octanol produced. Similarly, get the mass of 1 octanol using this equation where you use the area of the 1 octanol peak divided by the sum of the areas of all the peaks, again multiplied by the mass of the crude product mixture. This will give you actual yields and you'll need to use those in your percent yield calculations. Actual yield divided by theoretical yield times 100 equals percent yield. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video. And consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.